Thank you, Jay, for inviting me and for um, all of you for actually braving those intense Austin winter weather to show up here. As a Wisconsinite, I... Um, okay. Anyways, it was, <laughs> it was cold. I'll grant you that. Okay, so how many of you out there like animals? Okay, good. You are in the right place tonight. How many of you out there have ever wondered if other animals view the world differently than you do? All right. And how many of you out there have ever wondered why there are so many different colors of animals on this planet? Oh, excellent, because you are really in the right place this evening, because that's exactly the kind of question we'll be asking tonight and hopefully finding a few answers. And that's exactly the kind of question I used to ask when I was your age. And fortunately for me, I grew up to become an evolutionary biologist, and we get to answer those questions. Now, how does one become an evolutionary biologist who asks questions about animal colors? Well, in my case, it started off when I was about your age. I spent a whole lot of time outside. I played in the forest, I played in the lakes, I looked at animals and went, wow. And then I went off to college, and I was fortunate to go to a marine biology station um, one summer, and I spent most of the time underwater, looking at the crazy, beautiful world of the underwater creatures. And then after college, I went and spent six months playing in the jungles of Costa Rica, being a field assistant. Am I doing something wrong here, or we're all good? Okay, you let me know when I trip this up. Um, and then I went off to Australia for a year and did some further studying near the Great Barrier Reef. And at that point I was sold, evolutionary biology was the thing for me, and I went back to the States and got formal training. So, as evolutionary biologists, we look at color in terms of its function. Hmm. This isn't working quite so well. In fact, it's not working at all. Oh, you just had the magic truck so that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> okay, so we look in col at color in terms of the function. So in terms of what purpose color could serve, one purpose is that it could commu be to communicate with predators. Another purpose could be that it's meant to hide from predators. And a third purpose might be that it's used to communicate to others of your own species. And, as we evolutionary biologists sometimes notice, sometimes it serves all three purposes at once. So, in terms of evolutionary biology, we tend to group these questions into two main forces. The first force, which encompasses those first two questions, is termed natural selection. And that really talks about how animals evolve traits that help them survive, so the drive to survive. The next question is really grouped into the umbrella of sexual selection, which is really about traits that, are, that evolve to attract mates or a drive, our drive to pass on our genes. And oftentimes what we notice is that traits evolve by both, a, some combination of both of these forces. <clears throat> so if we're interested in the grand diversity of colors out there, we have to keep in mind that there's a grand diversity of organs used to see those colors and those are eyes. So you might notice that not all eyes look the same. There's a whole bunch of eyes out there that are really formed by a number of different multiple facets that all pool into one, such as in the yellow jacket eye, the fly, the dragonfly, and this beautiful ant lion. They have a, m lots of different mini eyes. Then there's animals out there like you and I who have pairs of eyes but even these pairs of eyes can look quite different than our own. And then there's some crazy creatures out there who have multiple independent eyes, such as this jumping spider that has eight eyes, which ex probably explains why I've been afraid of spiders pretty much all my life. Okay, so if you have different eyes out there, this might be an indication that different eyes view the world differently. And this is a good rendition of this, of that phenomenon. Here are some images, some photos, taken by my colleague and fellow evolutionary biologist, Dr. Larry Gilbert, where he digitized these in terms of putting a filter in front of the lens, uh, actually through Photoshop, as if it was being viewed from a different animal's perspective. 
And so from some of these images, it's quite easy to determine what animal he was taking a photo of. Here's images of butterflies, whereas some of the other images, it's a little more difficult. For instance, this rattlesnake seems quite cryptic viewed through this particular lens. And the reason why these images look differently is because different animals, through their different eyes, decode light in different ways. Now, there are a lot of different features of light that our eyes uh, are busy decoding. And tonight, we're going to be talking about three of those. The first of which is how bright a stimulus is or an object. And we can think about that in terms of how much light there is. So if we think about a sunny day, there's lots of light. Today was not a sunny day, quite a drab day, a very dull day out there. And then we can also think of light in terms of the color it is or what wavelength it is. And this is probably best demonstrated in terms of a rainbow. And this is when light gets split up, segregates by refraction and diffraction into the different wavelengths of light, with the short wavelengths being the blue part of the rainbow and the longer wavelengths being the red part of the rainbow. And then a third component of light that we'll be discussing tonight has to do with polarization. And polarization is a, is really deals with how light vibrates. And we don't really see it. In fact, we tend to try to get rid of the little polarization our eyes are able to see through polarized sunglasses. So tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you about research I do in my lab on two different sets of organisms. The first set has to do with poison frogs. And we'll be looking at how variation in their brightness as well as variation in their color might serve different functions in terms of allowing these animals to survive in nature. And then we'll be looking at some marine and freshwater fish in terms of their polarization and how they use polarized light either to communicate with others or to hide from predators. All right. So let's start with this first evolutionary force, natural selection and these first two questions, hiding or communicating with predators. We can really think of this as bringing it down to two strategies to survive. To hide or not to hide, that is the question these animals have to face. And we can think of lots of good examples of animals that blend into the background, so they're using a hiding strategy so that they're not detected. And this can be either by predators, such as this lion, who's blending in quite well to the grass, or the arctic fox, who's blending in to the snowy background, and even to prey animals, such as this leaf insect. You might think that there's an animal on top of a leaf on top of a leaf, but actually this whole thing is an animal. So it's blending in in terms of color of the leaf, but also shape. Very impressive example of crypsis. So this is the hide strategy in action. Let's look at the other strategy. We have a local pretty nasty snake out there known as the coral snake who uses really bright colors to stand out against its background, as does a skunk, which we're all familiar with, using its black and white conspicuous stripes to warn all of us that they have something nasty in store if you mess with them. So there are these two different strategies. And tonight I'd like to start off with the advertise your nastiness strategy. And for that, I'll be sharing with you some research I do with the poison dart frog. Now, poison dart frogs use their bright colors to communicate to predators that they are packing quite a bit of a punch on their back. In fact, the punch comes in the form of toxins. And when animals use bright coloration to advertise their toxicity, in the science world, we call that aposematism, or warning coloration. Now, some of you might be curious as to how these animals, how these poison dart frogs get their name. Well, <clears throat> they get their name because for hundreds of years, we humans have been taking advantage of the fact that these guys have some toxins and using them as weapons. So, for about well, 200 years, Local Indian tribes in South and Central America have rubbed their weapon of choice, be it a dart tip or an arrowhead, on the backs of these poison frogs and then put them into their uh, giant blow guns or bow and arrow and shoot their prey. And this has been a very effective means of killing their animals that they're interested in. As noted by an early explorer in 1825, 
Captain Charles Cochran described the effect, quote, a tiger, when hit, runs 10 or a dozen yards, staggers, becomes sick, and dies in four or five minutes. Now, Captain Charles, oops, Captain Charles might have been a good explorer. He managed to go all the way from England over to Colombia in a boat 200 years ago. But he clearly didn't take enough biology classes because he didn't realize that tigers are not found in South America. <laughs> That's okay, he mistook a jaguar for a tiger, it's understandable. But nonetheless, the point is clear. These poison dart frogs are as effective as modern day bullets. Now, you hunters in the audience might take note because I understand there's quite a shortage of ammunition. Uh, so, nonetheless, it's an impressive feat that these poison dart frogs can manage to do. So the next question you might have is how do poison dart frogs get their poisons? Are they born with it? Well, that answer is no. Instead, how they get their poisons is by eating toxic bugs. So these poison dart frogs are about as big as my thumb, thumb but they eat even smaller critters that are also toxic, such as these millipedes, uh, ants, and mites. And these little critters become toxic by eating plants and other little smaller critters. So it's this giant food web of toxins that are building up to these poison dart frogs. Okay, so the one species I spend a lot of time studying is known as the strawberry poison frog. And it gets its name because it has this beautiful strawberry colored back and blue legs. It's sometimes called the blue jeans frog, as you can now understand. But it's famous because it is probably one of the most colorful creatures on this planet. So every single photograph you see up here is a member of the same species. So they come in blue, they come in green, they come in orange, they come in yellow. Pretty much if you can think of a color, they have it. And this is pretty unusual and my lab tries to understand why. So this great diversity really happens in a very small geographic range. This small little island, uh, series of islands called an archipelago off the coast of Panama is where you see all this variation in color. Meanwhile, throughout most of its mainland range through Costa Rica, Nicaragua and Panama, it looks like this. But in this little area across a bunch of islands, it's changed all of its colors. And so we were curious as to why. And the first question we asked was, well, maybe if they're using their colors to communicate to predators, maybe they're telling the predators something about variation in toxicity. So are the different colors communicating different information? So my postdoc Martina Mann and I went out to study this. We measured the coloration of these frogs in terms of the reflectance and noted how bright or how dull these different animals were. And then we also measured their toxicity. And what we noticed is that there was a pattern. Brighter populations were more toxic than duller populations. And then because we are sensory biologists, we could take those reflectance curves and with some math and physiology predict or estimate which animal out there had the best ability to perceive this relationship between conspicuousness and toxins? And we looked through the eyes of crabs and snakes and frogs and birds. And of all those different viewers, the one that could see the relationship the best were birds. So this suggested that birds might be their number one predator. Okay, so at this point, we have some clues about what might be happening. We see that brightness is an indicator of toxicity. And so what we think is that as frog populations got established on some of these islands with fewer of those toxic bugs, the frogs themselves became less toxic. And so they themselves had to take on this new strategy of hiding from predators because they didn't pack a punch. Meanwhile, as frog populations found themselves on other islands that had more of those toxic bugs, the frogs themselves became more toxic and then they could take on that other strategy of increasing or advertising their toxicity. <clears throat> now remember how I, I told you that we used math and some physiology to predict who their major predator was but I'm, a, I'm an experimentalist. I like to actually go out and test this 
firsthand. So we wanted to see if birds really paid attention to this variation in color. Now fortunately for us, one of the most popular birds across these islands is the chicken. And this is really fortunate as an experimental biologist because chickens are always hungry and so they're always pecking at things they want to eat and we can use that as a proxy or some information of who they want to eat. So what we did is we went down to Panama and we went and we interviewed farmers on these islands and these farmers let their chickens run into the forest and the forest is filled with these poison frogs so these chickens are likely to have encountered a frog. And I would interview the farmer and I would say, well, sir, have you seen your chickens try to peck at these colorful frogs? Oh, si, 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 yes, yes, yes. Oh, great, may I rent your chickens? And he would look at me a little funny and he'd give me the big old stink eye for a little while and then he said, well, okay, but at a really high price. So I used up all my grant money renting chickens <laughs> and we brought them back to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Station where we built some chicken coops and we held, held these chickens there. And then we bought some city chickens. Now usually city chickens know a few things more than country chickens, but in this case it's reversed. The city chickens knew nothing about poison frogs, so they were our control chickens. Okay. So what we wanted to do is ask whether or not chickens treated poison frogs different from non-toxic frogs. So a lot of wonderful students helped with this project and we built this little experimental cage and for each chicken we would give them a choice between a poison frog and a non-toxic frog. Now before you get worried, no one, no one got hurt in this experiment because all the frogs sat underneath this plexiglass dome. And fortunately, chickens are smart enough to try to, well, you'll see if they're smart enough to learn, but they're not smart enough to realize they can't get through a plexiglass dome, which is wonderful for our experiment. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is data, f oh, first thing I want to show you is actually a little uh, a bit of this experiment. So here is one of those island chickens. She is familiar with the frog on frog color over here, the toxic frog on the right. She checks out her local frog and, and runs back to that non-toxic brown frog, checks out the local colorful one. Ooh, I remember how that tasted and goes back to the non-toxic one. How many of you have chickens in your backyard? Okay, a few hands. So now you have a great experiment you can do in backyard science. It's a lot of fun. I fell in love with chickens down in Panama. All right. So that was an island chicken, very savvy island chicken, knows what's going on when it comes to poison frogs. Let's look at those urban chickens and see what happens with their data. So when we looked at those naive chickens, they're naive, which means they were unfamiliar with poison frogs, and we look at the amount of pecking they did, so whether they wanted to eat the poison toxic frog or the non-toxic frog, we noticed no difference in peck rate, okay? They were just as likely to want to eat the poisonous frog as they were the non-toxic frog. Okay. Next, we looked at those chickens from this one island, Isla Pastores, chickens that were familiar with this particular colored poison frog, and we asked them the same question. And when we looked at their data, we saw a big difference between which frog they were interested in eating. They were not interested in eating this poisonous uh, green frog, but they were interested in eating the non-toxic brown frog. Then, how many of you did the uh, aposomatic M&M study out there? A few of you. How many of you avoided picking after you ate it that nasty red M&M? When you got the bowl of all those different colors, how many of you avoided the red ones in that next round? Okay, some of you are as smart as those chickens. <laughs> Way to go! Woohoo! Okay, things are changing on me. Alrighty, okay, so the next thing we did is we asked these chickens, okay, you're smart enough to realize that this thing is nasty, but what happens when we give you all sorts of new crazy colored frogs from different islands? What do you do with those? And what we found out is that not only do these chickens avoid their local colored frog, they also avoid these new colors found on the other islands. 
And this is interesting, and this is called generalized avoidance. And it might become a very important attribute of the system to allow new colors to form. So at this point, what we know from a natural selection point of view is that brightness inform, informs predators how nasty the frogs are, and that once they've learned that one bright color is nasty, they tend to avoid new colors. Okay. So remember, there's two forces out there involved in color evolution, natural selection and sexual selection. So sexual selection is, deals with, uh, in terms of this talk, how animals use colors to attract mates. And we are familiar with the, the wonderful poster child for that, which is the peacock and his beautiful, colorful tail. We also have local varieties that use color, such as fireflies that have glowing abdomens. And we humans are also not immune <laughs> to this. Many a, a male and female have been known to get quite flashy and, uh, in terms of what they wear to attract presumably the opposite sex or whatever sex you're interested in. So we decided to see whether or not uh, poison frogs were paying attention to their own colors in terms of attracting mates. So for this, we created a frog dating game. We set up this frog arena, and we made the mood just right. We piped in all the little chit 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 which is a frog mating call. And we uh, got the, the mood lighting just right, forest lighting. And then we gave females a choice of two males. We would always take two males, and we would size match them, and then make sure the males were the same color and the same brightness. And then what we would do is manipulate the female's perception of brightness by using neutral density filters above one of the two males. And we'd always switch it. And that way a female could view each male in his bright and his dull form. And then we would measure the amount of time females spent interacting with these two different kinds of males. And we did this for four different populations. And across all four populations, males would call, hola chica, hola chica, hola chica. But across all four, despite the color, the females always, oh, mi amor, she always liked the bright guy. So if, if in the red populations, the orange and the blue and the green. And this is in Spanish because remember, these frogs are in Panama, and I'm pretty sure they have a running Spanish monologue going through their heads. <laughs> All righty. So at this point, we've seen these two great forces of evolution, natural and sexual selection, combine to help uh, inform the diversity of we see across this system. So we see from a natural selection point of view that colors and brightness indicate toxicity, and where we have less toxic frogs tend to use that hide strategy, whereas more toxic frogs tend to use that advertise and be really conspicuous strategy. And what's interesting is that predators, once they learn one color, then generalize, which allows the Pandora's box to be open that any new color could arise and predators might avoid that as well. And new colors might arise because mates are always wanting a brighter, brighter male. And eventually you could change from one color to a new color just in the interest of becoming brighter. Okay, so we have just finished the now you see me part of this talk. And we are now going to get into the now you don't see me part of this talk. And there's really a double entendre because we're heading into a portion of the light field that we don't see. And that's polarized light. And I just want to point out that the next uh, set of this talk, the next research that I'll be sharing with you tonight, is actually funded by the military. And that is because the military is wise enough to understand that animals often have the solution to human problems. Now, why would the military, in this case the Navy, be interested in polarization? Well, the Navy is interested in being able to hide things in the middle of the ocean. And how we detect things in the middle of the ocean, at least from space, is through satellites. And there's three ways to detect things using satellites from space. It's basically the three same components of light we have been talking about so far. You can use brightness differences, you can use color differences, and you can use polarization differences. And of those three components, the most sensitive way to detect things in the ocean 
is polarization. And that's why the Navy is interested in evolutionary biology to see if some animals have solved their problems for them. So thankfully they funded me. <laughs> okay, thankfully from my perspective. All right, here we go. So what about this polarization? What is it? Polarization really refers to, in the most boiled down sense, is how the light waves are vibrating. Okay. Light waves, when they enter our atmosphere, are vibrating in every possible direction, willy-nilly. Every single direction you can think of, a photon is vibrating. When it interacts or hits things like a water, oops, a water surface, these water, this water actually favors vibration in a particular direction. So when all the light was coming in every possible direction, it hits the water surface, and then suddenly almost all the light is bouncing in the same direction. The only way we see polarized light then is at this particular time because all the light is bouncing in this one direction and we call that, anyone know what we call that? Glare, all right, well done. So we call that glare and we get rid of polarized light using polarized sunglasses. So how polarized sunglasses work is they simply black out one direction of the polarized light field. And more often than not, it's that horizontal direction coming up off the surface. And so when we look out at the uh, surface of the lake or an ocean, we put on our polarized sunglasses and the world gets a little darker. Okay, I've got a little trick for you that you should be able to make a little money on. And that is, how many of you have gone out to Lake Travis or Lake Austin and, and used your polarized sunglasses to, to take out glare? Some of you? Okay. Well, the next time you go out and you and your friend have your polarized sunglasses on, you can turn to your friend and say, I bet you I can make the world a whole, bit, a whole lot brighter even with those sunglasses on. And he or she is going to be like, yeah, right, I'll take your bet. So you take your bet and then you say, okay, now turn your head 90 degrees. And they're going to turn their head 90 degrees and suddenly all that glare is going to go smack dab into their eye. And you're going to make a nice little pocket change. And if you could, there's a sequester going on with research funds. If you could give me a cut, it would be really helpful because all of us are a little handcuffed right now in terms of scientific research. Okay. So there are two places on Earth that are, have the light field to be largely polarized. One is the sky. And that's, again, because of light interacting with water vapor. And the other is the ocean or the lakes or the rivers. And in both of these places, we have animals that have evolved mechanisms to detect this polarized light field. Flies and antlions, and in lakes and oceans, we have salmon and, in this case, swordtails. <clears throat> now, I'm about to go into a whole bit of this talk about polarized light, and it's kind of a bummer because you and I don't really see it. So we've concocted a plan for you to actually see polarized light tonight. So you may not realize this, but all of your, most of your computer monitor displays are actually created through polarized light and polarized filters. So what we did up here is we took, we, wonderful people in my lab, um, took off the top layer of these, polar, of these uh, computer monitors um, and if you look at it, all you see is white blur because you have no means to organize the light field because our eyes are pretty boring when it comes to polarized light detection. But we've created nice little treats for you. If you haven't found them already, you have a special set of polarized glasses taped to the bottom of your seat. All right. How these glasses are set up? is that one side is, or, is letting in polarized light at a 45 degree orientation and the other side at 135. Now what I'm going to do is start this slideshow and you're about to see a whole bunch of images that you could only see um, because you have these glasses on. So I want you to do a few couple uh, tricks and that should help you really drive home the point that polarization is about angles. So I want you to close one eye and look at the imagery, and then I want you to close the other eye and look at the imagery, 
And then I want you to tilt your head to find the exact angle. Woohoo! Yeah! And then I want to make sure you really appreciate this. Take those glasses every once in a while and lift them up and be like, oh my god, it's just white fuzz. And then come back down. Yeah. Is this cool or what? Ow! It's awesome. I heard an awesome over there. Okay. Way awesome. It's better than awesome. You just made my night, young man. Okay. Cool. So hopefully you realize that the world at this point, we already knew the world was a big, beautiful, colorful place. But now you can imagine it's even more beautiful and more colorful and more diverse than we thought before because there's a whole bunch of animals out there that are using this characteristic of light to communicate or hide. So let's take a look at some of those examples. So one example are some freshwater fish, the sword tails that we work with in our lab. And in this species, the male is the pretty one. He has all these beautiful blue ornaments. And the female is the drab one, and she's kind of checking him out. And so we wanted to determine whether or not males um, use polarized ornaments to attract females. And when I say we, I'm talking about myself and a fabulous graduate student of mine, Gina Calabrese, who is somewhere in this audience. Gina, could you please stand? Where are you? Anyway, she's, she's out there, and she did a great job. Exactly. So Gina took these males, and she viewed them through a video polarimeter. And when you do that, you can evaluate how much polarized light is coming off these males. So how you see this schematic is if you see an area with a lot of red and yellow, that means that male is reflecting a lot of polarized light. If it's blue, he's reflecting less polarized light. Any place you see an arrow indicates a body region in which males, boys, males, are reflecting a lot more polarized light than females are. That feature, when there's a difference between the sexes, is called sexual dimorphism. And that's usually a good sign or a clue that this trait is being used to attract mates. So the next thing, well, let me give you a view. Again, it's always fun to see this in terms of how the animal might see it. So if we could see polarized light, we might be able to see these animals swimming around looking something like this. So this is a video polarimetry um, uh, clip where the colors represent different angles of polarization. The background is one angle. Did you see that male? He had the stripes of a different angle. So male sword tails might use this ornamentation to really look conspicuous against the background and kind of flash and be flashy to their females. Okay. So Gina concocted this amazingly elaborate testing environment. And it was elaborate because it was very neat in that it held constant these other parts of the light field, color and intensity, while just manipulating the polarized parts of the light field. And she did that through very clever placement of diffusion tanks and polarizing filters on each side. It alternated. And what that was able to do then was basically have one side of the tank have a very high degree of polarized illumination and the other side a very low degree. And so the first thing she did was do controls and just see whether or not females like to hang out in highly polarized environments versus low polarized environments. And what she found is females didn't care in terms of where they were swimming. That didn't matter. But when she put the males in, suddenly the females' behavior became non-random. They wanted to be where that that uh, very polarized guy was. So what we're thinking is that females prefer their polarized gentlemen, and it's probably because they can stand out and get a little flashy against their background. Okay, so you've seen polarized light in terms of sexual selection, and you can imagine just all the different animals out there that might be flashy with this cool, angular-dependent light field. What about natural selection? How do you hide in polarized light field? So if we think about hiding, remember we've looked at some examples of animals who've done an amazing job blending into their specific background with this leaf insect and these fox. And it's pretty easy if you think about it, if you have a very specific back, uh, physical background to blend against, maybe you could do that. But if we think about the ocean, 
life gets a little bit more complicated. There's not a tree, there's not a leaf, there's not a rock, there's not a pile of snow to blend in against. Instead, you are basically hiding in plain sight in this 3D featureless world. And so it can be kind of scary if you're out there and a small orange fish in a big blue ocean you're going to be nabbed by a big, unless this shark is a vegetarian. Um, nonetheless, it's a difficult place to hide, and, and people have been curious how they should do this. For the last 40 or 50 years, there's been this hypothesis that the best way to hide in the ocean is to cover yourself with mirrors. And that's because one would think that in the middle of the ocean, the left side of your body has one set of light that is very similar to the right side of your body. And so if you put a mirror up here, it should do perfectly well because everything's the same. And people noted that, wow, maybe fish are doing this because fish look awfully silvery like a mirror. And so this might be the case. Right now I'm about to show you um, an amazing uh, simulation that was put together by an amazing biologist also in my lab Ian Etheridge, would you please stand? Uh, Ian, right here, as well as Paris Schrady. You're going you're gonna to see three absolutely gorgeous simulations. And I think this is a great example of if you have a passion for computers and a passion for animals, you have a future in biology. So keep that in mind. So this is a simulation um, of a fish in an environment acting like a mirror when all you have to worry about in the light field is brightness and color. It's doing a pretty good job, right? It's kind of blending in. It looks basically the same intensity as, as long as it doesn't open its mouth. <laughs> it's got the same intensity. Whoa, I think I just did something bad. Um, okay, anyways, pretty good job in terms of brightness and color and matching. But remember I was talking about those satellites that are orbiting the Earth? and the most sensitive way to detect things is using polarization? Well, you're about to find out why that is. So if we think about the polarized light field in the ocean, at high noon when the sun is directly overhead, this is the one time where the polarized light field is simple. And that's because everywhere a fish would look if it spun around 360 degrees, it would see the same angle of polarized light. This is the only time life is simple in the ocean in terms of polarization. So here a mirror might work. Okay. However, when the sun goes away from high noon and goes over to mid-afternoon conditions or down on the horizon near sunset, the polarized light field becomes incredibly complex. Now the angle of polarized light on the right side of this fish's body is very different than the angle of polarized left on its left side of its body and it's different from what's in front of it and behind. So in this condition, a mirror is not going to work. It's going to actually bounce off the wrong angle of polarized light. And we're about to see, again, another beautiful um, simulation of this. This is a fish acting like a mirror, but now the world is coded in terms of polarization, angle of polarization. So as the, spi as the fish or a predator is spinning around the fish 360 degrees and it had polarization sensitive eyesight, it would be able to pick up this fish because it would contrast against the background because it was reflecting the wrong angle of polarized light. Do you guys notice that? It really sticks out against the background? Okay. So what we wanted to know and what the Navy wanted to know is whether or not nature evolution had conquered this problem. So what do you do? Well, what we did to, to ask or answer this question is we went out and we built a video polarimeter. And when, we say, when I say we, I really mean Dr. Parrish Brady, who is in the room tonight. Parrish, would you please stand up? Where are you? Yes. Parrish is amazing. Parrish got his PhD in astrophysics, and then he saw the light and came to biology. It's never too late to come to biology. He built this beautiful video polarimeter, and the beauty of that is that we got to go scuba diving with it. Woohoo! And that's Parrish and I right there. And then we measured a bunch of fish. Okay. 
So this is Parrish and I out on a typical day as a biologist. We are measuring um, fish in the ocean off the Texas coast on oil rigs. This is my job, and people wonder why I smile as much as I do. This is why. So when we were out there, what we did is we noticed that this one particular species of fish, known as the look down, was doing a really good job of blending into the light field. Now, look downs get their name because of their funny shape. They've got eyes way up here and noses way down there, so they always look like they're looking down. So this is why they have their name. And what we did is we caught these guys, and then we brought them into the lab, and we measured them in all specific light conditions that we thought were relevant to camouflage. And what we noticed is that they were doing something different from a mirror, and it seemed like they were doing something better than a mirror. So we took these measurements, and then we put them into fancy physics models that involved a lot of math, so stay in your math classes. And then we simulated once more what the difference was between a mirror strategy and a look-down strategy in terms of camouflage. So this is a simulation, again done by Parrish and Ian. On the left side is going to shoot. On the left side is going to be a fish that acts like a mirror. On the right side is now this fish, but now we, we calculated in the properties of a true look down and what a look down does in this simulated open ocean environment. So you be the judge which animal does a better or which strategy does a better job. So we've got the mirror kind of bright, all right. And then over here we see the look downs are more muted than the mirror and we're coming around. They're both look about the same head on and then we're back to this side and again it would seem that the mirror stands out quite a bit and the look down while not invisible is doing a much better job at reducing the difference between background and its, and its body. Now this is a hypothesis, right? We took measurements, we put them into a model, we calculated some predicted difference and we have this hypothesis that the look down is doing a better job than the mirror. But you know what? You should never let a hypothesis lie on the table like that. So instead of just being done with our work, we decided to go back into the field and test it with live animals in a live ocean with changing optical conditions. So we did these measurements both in the Florida Keys and in Curaçao, which is in the Caribbean, with a whole group of scientists, both young and older, and we had a lot of fun doing it. So you guys go on summer vacations and you come home with videos. Well, scientists do the same thing. This is my summer vacation video um, from Curaçao. So we took a gang of scientists down and we built this contraption that would spin our fish and the video polarimeter around in different orientations. This is me. My job was to be a fish whisperer. I would put a live fish in this netting against this mirror. And the whole goal here is to measure with the video polarimeter whether the fish blends into the background or the mirror blends into the background better. It was a head-to-head -head contest. Who's going to win? So right now I'm getting the video polarimeter all good to go. Once I'm convinced it's ready, I'm going to signal to the people on the surface that we're going to rotate it around. They're going to talk to the people in the boat. They're going to do some contraptions and start rotating the whole apparatus around. So you can see we're measuring with the video polarimeter or the fish as the fish gets turned around 360 degrees with the sun at a specific angle. So we did this over and over again in different positions with a different camera, different camera angle where the sun was in a different position and the fish was in a different position. Okay, now you just saw what it looked like to a human watching that. Now let's look at that fish and that mirror, fish, mirror, background, through the lens of the video polarimeter. Okay, so pay attention to color because color here indicates the angle of polarized light. Here's the fish, here's the mirror, here's the background. So you don't see it moving, but we're moving 360 degrees, and your job is to pay attention Who's doing a better job of blending into the background on each side, the mirror or the fish? fish. Hey, hey, I like that answer over there. Good job. Okay, this is a human. <laughs> 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 
we didn't use that part of the data set, but yes, we kept going all the way around. Still convinced the fish is doing a better job? I, I like this section over here. Okay, so this is all the way through. Okay, so we're near to the end, all right. So scientists don't measure things once, they measure them thousands of times to make sure that whatever pattern we see is real, is the truth. And so we measured this in all these different angles. We measured it when the sun was at different altitudes on the off the horizon. We measured it with different camera angles and different fish angles. Okay. And then we boiled it down, did a whole bunch of number crunching, and then asked the simple question, who does a better job of Crypsis? Is it the mirror strategy, which has been the running go-to strategy for the last 40 years or 50 years in open ocean camouflage? Or is it this new strategy, which we call the polarocryptic strategy, that the fish appears to use? Okay, so remember, what we're trying to do here is calculate the difference between the background and the fish versus the background and the mirror across all those measurements. Okay, do, so what we do is across those thousands of measurements figure out what proportion of the time the fish does better than the mirror. So if it's above this 50% line, it means that across all those thousands of measurements, more often than not, more than 50% of the time, the fish did a better job than the mirror in terms of being cryptic. If it's less than 50%, it means mirror man wins. Okay. How many fish backers do I have in the audience? All right, okay. How many mirror backers do I have in the audience? All right, I like the, I, I like the rebels out there. Okay, but I admit. Okay, and the winner is, yo baby, it's the fish, which of course I'm a little bit biased. Um, I feel a little close to them. But okay, so what we see here, both with two different species, we did this with the big-eyed scad, as well as the look down, across all these different solar angles and those various other angles, more than 50% of the time, the fish outperform the mirror in terms of being cryptic in the open ocean condition. So at this point, we're really excited. We have a novel strategy for blending in into the open ocean environment. And now, as scientists, what we're trying to figure out is how they're doing this. So we're going into the microscope and figuring out what property in their skin is allowing them to blend in better than a mirror does. Okay, so to wrap things up, if we were looking at the grand diversity in color, we've been looking at it through a number of different questions. One is, possibly, are they using their colors to communicate with predators? And we saw that with the poison dart frogs, that if they were more toxic, they were going to advertise that. We also saw that some poison dart frogs even hide. They use that other strategy if they've lost their toxins. And we just saw a beautiful example how fish can hide, even in the open ocean in plain sight. We also saw two good examples how animals use their colors to communicate with conspecifics or other, species, other individuals of their own species. We saw that in the poison dart frog, as well as in sore tails, where females are paying attention either to the brightness aspect of males or the polarized aspects of males. And what I'd like to point out is we're seeing examples where all three questions come into play. So I hope you've, through tonight's talk that you've seen a good example that the world is a big, beautiful, colorful place. And I hope you now have a little bit more insight as to why that might be. And I'd like to give thanks to my amazing lab who helped produce all these wonderful visual displays you saw here, as well as beforehand you saw a bunch of, or you partook in a few great examples of animal diversity. So thank you and I'm happy to take questions. Question for Professor Cummings. I can't really see at this point. Ah, oops. So you said a lot of the research is funded by the name, right? And I would imagine there are different types of chemicals they might want to take advantage of. One being satellites, yes. One being also the naked eye, maybe periscope, a submarine, or something like that. Is there a way to incorporate something that's a camouflage mechanism that would be great for polarization like the fish, but also great for the human eye more like a mirror? 
Well, I would, I, I oversimplified, but actually these fish are doing both that. So we, when we look at contrast in Crypsis, we include intensity and color as well as polarization. So it's really all three things that these fish are doing. But I just boiled it down to the polarization for this particular talk. Yes? Right, absolutely, it has huge bearings. So we tend to have three different types of cone uh, detector cells in our eyes called photoreceptors, and they're sensitive to different parts of the spectrum of light, blue, green, and yellow-green. We call it red, but it's really yellow-green. And uh, birds have a fourth cone, and they can see into the UV. A lot of fish also see into the UV. And then butterflies are shifted to different... Uh, colors than we can see. So that's why it's important to know which animal is seeing what color and then you can predict what kind of colors they should evolve to be conspicuous to themselves or to conspicuous or inconspicuous to their predator. Yes? Right. So the question is, these fish are darn cool, and what do we know about the structures that allow them to do this polarized reflectance? So it appears to be a combination, and we're working on this now. We haven't quite published, so I'm going to be a little cryptic about it. But uh, it seems to be a combination of collagen, which are this is kind of this clear-looking thing in the skin, and iridophores, which are very bright um, uh, mirror-like structures inside the skin of these fish. And what we're trying to figure out is how active or passive this is. So whether or not the animals need to move things around or whether or not they can just be in one position and passively their structures are doing this for them. And that's still a mystery that we're trying to figure out, but it's really neat. Fish have all these cool um, colored cells that we don't have. We're pretty boring. We've just got, you know, this. And they have really neat things like iridophores and chromatophores, and they can move them, and they can turn them on and off. And that's why fish and frogs are fun to study in terms of color. So when you showed the slide earlier with the different kinds of animals and bugs and different kinds of eyes, that the crocodiles and the owl people have two traditional looking eyes, like look like ours, but no bugs have different kinds of eyes. There for a reason that Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I did group those by vertebrates and invertebrates. So um, the vertebrate eye tends to be like a, uh, our, our eye, a single reflex camera, whereas a lot of invertebrates, many invertebrates, tend to have a compound eye with many facets of eyes pulling into one. But some, in, some things without, animals without backbones have similar eyes to us. So it is a, a, it's an evolutionary um, phenomenon that this whole group of animals without backbones tend to have this kind of eye, whereas we vertebrates tend to have our paired eyes um, rather than our compound eyes. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, say that again? You mean how many fish have this cool property? Yes. So that's a great question, and we are asking that, trying to answer that right now. So we asked, do all these fish do this polarocrypsis thing? And right now, the two species I showed you are members of the same fish family, Carangidae. They're big jacks. But when you look at fish that live in the seagrass, like really close to the coast here, such as the pinfish, have anyone seen a pinfish? They're very common. They don't do this at all. They do something completely different. They scramble light a lot like a mirror does. And so this is not a property that all fish have in terms of polarocrypsis, but these open ocean fish tend to have it, and near shore fish don't have it. And that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Uh-huh. 
Yes, you. That's a great question. So these little guys that I've been working with, these little poison frogs, they don't actually bite you because they don't have to because they just kind of sit around and look at you and they say, yeah, you're going to mess with me? Just lick my back. And so they don't actually bother. In fact, it's amazing. A lot of frogs, they're hard. To, have you ever gone frogging, try to find frogs? Have you tried to do that? Well, you should try it. Say that again? Oh, okay. <laughs> you stumbled across some frogs? Well, you would be really good at finding them, stumbling across them in, in Panama because the forest is filled with them. And they don't have to hide because they're so nasty, no one bothers them. Some, yes? Yeah. Oh, you're done? Okay. <laughs> uh huh. Oh, I was hoping no one would ask that question. Okay, the question is how did I measure the toxicity? So, well, unfortunately, I had to sacrifice a few frogs to do that. Yeah, I know, I know. I apologize. I always apologize before I kill an animal but, and tell them I'm going to make them famous. So thank you for making them famous. So I would take them, apologize, and then quickly kill them in the most humane way possible. And then we would take their skin off. Uh, yeah, that's why we kill them first. We take their skin off. <laughs> Then we extract out their toxins using methanol. And then, this is where we finally got humane. Then we, we uh, had a bunch of um, mice that were sleeping. And we... <laughs> no, they lived, they lived, they lived. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a little cold. Then we diluted that bit of toxin. And then we would inject them. Whoa, sorry. My holsters got a little heavy. Um, we injected them into the sleeping mice and then we would measure the amount of time that the mice were all agitated and, and, and waited until they went back to sleep. And we used that as a measure of how toxic they were. <laughs> I was hoping no one would ask that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. You, ask, you guys are asking awesome questions. That's a great question. We have not yet looked at uh, freshwater fish in terms of polar eucrypsis, but I want to. So maybe when you're a few years older, you can come and hang out with us at the lakes and we'll measure cool freshwater fish. Yeah, right over there. You mean, don't use my favorite chicken? Oh. Um, that is a really good question. So we have done visual modeling using two different bird visual models and they appear to be able to see it the same way. That whether or not you're a bird that is um, a chicken type bird or a bird that's a soft bird, you should be able to see this relationship the same way. And so we're thinking, we need to test it like you're suggesting. If we got a you know, a hawk or a sparrow and see if they would do the same thing. That would be a great, a great thing to do. Say, Molly, there's a, a question from uh, people watching the live webcast. This comes from the group at Rice University, and the question is, how did the bright frogs know they were more toxic than the other ones? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, Self-awareness. Hmm. Um, it's, we think there's probably coevolution be between behavior and toxicity. Um, if they're able to, if they have to move different places to find different food items, they might end up just slowly becoming more cryptic in terms of their behavior. Presumably, they started off evolve or eventually becoming toxic, and then as animals became less toxic, uh, the animals that stopped um, were hanging out and not being cryptic, they would be picked off by birds, and because they were less toxic, actually eaten. So it's only animals that became more cryptic that survived to pass on their genes. So that's presumably how evolution works or in this system. Yes? Yeah. 
Yeah, how do, we keep asking that question over and over again. How do they do that? And we are convinced that it's a really tricky process and that different layers in the fish skin, layers that, some layers we have, we have collagen, but they have different kinds of collagen. And then that they have these little like micromeres called iridophores that are reflecting certain parts of the polarized light field back. And we don't have anything like that. We're kind of boring. But these fish are able to somehow use this combination of these different kinds of cells to reflect just the right angle of polarized light and stick around and maybe come visit my lab in a few years and we'll know the exact answer. Maybe you can even be part of that answer in a few years. Yes. Yes. That's a super question. So we have this hypothesis, Parrish has done a lot of modeling, that let's say this polarocrypsis is a passive process, that they just have structures in their skin. This means that if these look down actually tilted their body at the right time of day, they could actually increase their crypsis even more. So through modeling, we have these predictions that if animals track the sun, they become more cryptic. So what we'd like to do is go out to the oil rigs and simply watch and video these fish throughout the day and see if their movements track the sun in a way that would be adaptive and potentially increase their crypsis. So that's a great question and, and we still don't know the answer. Way in the back, yeah. Yes. Great question. So I love chickens and one of the things I love about them is they're smart enough to dabble and taste and spit things out. So what they do is, I'm going to now mimic a chicken. So they go over, and you've, have you, how many of you have chickens? It was hard to see. Oh, good, lots. So they do the whole like binocular look at their frog and then they will peck at it. They'll get it in their beak and then they'll spit it out. And in another study, um, different study where we actually taste them and do that. One silly chicken swallowed the frog and unfortunately it died. But all the other chickens would peck at the frog, get a little taste on their, on their tongue, how they could actually survive and learn, as opposed to how the genes in their parents or anything like that. Way in the back. Oh, in the uh, break Yes. Well, that's what we, an answer to your latter question, we believe they are working together. So in those populations where they have a lot of toxicity, sexual selection can drive it open to the color and then natural selection is going to avoid it. So they're working in the same direction. Where natural selection and sexual selection seem to be at odds with each other are the islands where they don't have a lot of those toxic prey uh, bug items. And even though females seem to want brighter males, it seems that natural selection is, is, t is keeping a, a lid on it and not allowing brighter individuals to evolve. So we think that in different places, the two forces can work synergistically and sometimes they're working in an opposing fashion. And there is variation in items. That has been determined by another colleague. Oh, oh yes, he's in the red. How do they survive while eating toxic bugs? Is that your question? That is a great question and we don't know how they can take these toxic things and not only that, so they take all those toxins and they pack them in their back, okay? They're all hanging out in their back. Get this, you know where they carry their baby frogs, their tadpoles? On their back. So it's like taking your babies and putting them in toxic soup and saying, lullaby baby, enjoy this. And yet they survive. So, t you know, animals who are like this, poison frogs, um, various other animals that can actually survive toxins, we can learn a lot in terms of physiology and figure out ways that we can stop potentially toxic effects. 
So that's a great question, and maybe when you grow up to be a great scientist, we can solve that problem. Thank you for asking that. Are there other ones? Uh, yes. They're, they tend to work on sodium channels, so neurons, they're neurotoxic, um, they're alkaloids, and these particular frogs have an incredible array of these potential toxins. They're, they've been specific alkaloids have been named after them, pomiliotoxins, because of this particular species. So people do gas chromatography to identify the different compounds, and you can have upward towards 20 to 30 different alkaloid types in the skins of these guys. And that's different from other toxic animals which tend to specialize on one or two kind of alkaloids. But they tend to be sodium channel blockers is what we believe they're, how they're operating. Do you have a final question for Dr. Well, it's smack dab in the center, yep. Right, because that poison is making it to the bloodstream, uh, presumably. So the dart goes in, enters the bloodstream, whereas the mouth is, is not actually getting into the bloodstream. So they're doing a quick sample and then a spit, so it doesn't actually go into its system. Does that make sense to you? Well, I'm sure Dr. Cummings would be happy to chat with some of you afterwards while we're doing the raffle. So let's thank him for our amazing time.